Do we have more fixed stories? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 13. Boy, you know I love a good fig story. But we had some heavy conversation in our last podcast in chapter 12. This time we're going to start out with people were asking Jesus about these Galileans. And it says, quote, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Just stay for right now. We don't know what that was. Were Galileans walking towards the temple for their sacrifices and Pilate slaughtered them all and the sacrifices they were bringing to the temple? There were many incidences of where Pilate slaughtered people. There was something in Mount Gezerim. There was another situation that happened much later. We're not sure what event happened, but they're asking Jesus, what about those Galileans? Tell us about them. And so Jesus says, do you think that these Galileans were worse than anybody? We're the, like the worst sinners in the world because this terrible thing happened to them? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. The, another situation where the tower in Siloam fell and killed 18 people. You think they're horrible people? They're worse offenders than anyone? The answer is no. That essentially bad things happen to all people. We're all going to face death, the good and the bad alike. Is there something that they did to make these horrible events happen to them? Is this like curse coming down on them from God? No, it's not. You have to repent just like they have to repent. Everybody is in the same boat when it comes to our lifelong sins. It does no good to sit there and say, this bad thing happened, they must be a sinner, or this horrible thing happened and they must have fallen through their sin. This is happening to everybody. Everybody's going to die. So everyone has to repent in that same way. He says, this is essentially God leveling the field. Don't judge a person by what happens to them in their lives. And it wasn't that these Galileans or the people in the pole of Siloam were innocent or guilty, they're in the same boat all of us are. They're guilty, we're guilty, it's all true. And now we come to another parable of figs. So a man had a fig tree, but it is vineyard. And he was looking for fruit, and you know what? It didn't have any on there. So he went to the vineyard guy and said, for three years, I've come to this fig tree hoping to find figs, and there's no figs here. Cut it down. Why should it use up any more ground? And so then the vineyard guy says, well, let's leave it alone for a year. And I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to treat it specially. Let's just see if it can bear fruit one more year. And if it doesn't, then let's cut it down. And that's the end of the peril. Kind of leaves us hanging, but I don't think it is leaving us hanging because we're looking for extra grace. If God was not patient with us, if God did not give us time to eventually grow good fruit, we would be left in a position where we couldn't produce fruit. We would never get to that point. That's where I think it's talking about in those early Matthew parables where we're going to not separate the wheat from the chaff. We're not going to separate the weeds from the wheat until the very end of time. The angels are going to do it on the day of judgment. We want to give every fig tree, every human, a chance to produce good fruit. And he's even going to, as our farmer, fertilize us, give us special care, treat us well. He's going to prepare us to grow good food. He's going to do everything he can to help us be a productive fruit. He's hoping that Israel and the rabbis and the Sadducees and the Pharisees are going to do so likewise. He is hoping the Gentiles, all of us who are not Jewish, he's hoping the Gentiles will do likewise. He is hoping every person on planet will eventually produce good fruit and not be a barren fig. Jesus was teaching in the synagogues again, and a woman came and she was, it says, had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She she couldn't sit up straight. She was bent over. And Jesus called over to her and it says, Quote, woman, you are freed from your disability. Having a disability like that is a burden on someone. And then he laid his hands on her and she immediately straightened up. Now, of course, the rulers of the synagogue, we saw this coming, right? Were indignant. 
because he healed another person on the Sabbath day. You know, they just keep getting mad. I mean, I don't know if these are the same people in the synagogue. He's been traveling around synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, and he just keeps doing this on the Sabbath day. And he is going to educate people every chance he can about this whole Sabbath business, that there's six days, it says, to work. And then on the seventh day, you need to be healed. Don't come on a Sabbath. Come on any other day. There's six other days out there. Just go do that. And Jesus said, would you feed your ox and your donkey? If you have something that you care about, wouldn't you care for it on Sabbath? Of course you would. And you know what? This woman, daughter of Abraham, Satan tied her up all these years. And why wouldn't you heal her on Sabbath day? Here's the interesting trick is that one of the commentaries says, it's nowhere in the Bible at all that you can't heal on Sabbath. It's embarrassing to them that they keep doing this. This is a horrible thing. Of course, God always cares about people and their status every day of the week, not just the six days, not just one of the days. He cares about them every day. And he does this as a point. That first of all, he said at one point that the Sabbath was made for man. It is meant for us to rest. But that doesn't mean we don't care for people. That doesn't mean God doesn't care for us on the Sabbath. I mean, can you imagine if one day a week God doesn't answer our prayers, doesn't listen to our prayers, doesn't look out for us? I mean, that's terrible, right? God always cares for us every day of the week. And if we can make someone's life better, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it on Sabbath. I told you before, and we talked about this before, about there were all these rules that they made up as what you can do on Sabbath and what you couldn't. So you couldn't reap wheat, but you could crumble up some of the heads of the wheat plant and eat that. You know, you couldn't, in my grandmother's house, turn on the stove during Sabbath or turn it off or turn pages of a book. I mean, there were all these rules in there that I was very frustrated with. You can tell I am wound up about Sabbath, but we care about people. And I wonder if they came up with these rules because they say, well, how is a rabbi supposed to have Sabbath that people are going to come to them with all their problems on Sabbath? We don't get our Sabbath, you know? So we're just going to have a complete amnesty from all responsibility because of the Sabbath. We're not going to do anything because then someone would have to work. But you know what? People have to work. Doctors have to work on Sabbath. We have to heal people on Sabbath. It is more important that we care for people. And that is what Jesus keeps talking, why he keeps going on this journey so that from synagogue to synagogue and having the same Sabbath battle with every single one of them. Now, he talks about this journey and you can tell we're not talking about location very much, but this is him starting his walk towards Jerusalem. So this is going to be this exodus. This, this time that we talked about in the Transfiguration, where he is now leading his people out of sin, like Moses led his people out of slavery. Jesus is going to bring us out of slavery from sin in this journey to Jerusalem, which is going to end with his death and his resurrection and the fulfillment of his kingdom. Talks about the mustard seed and the leaven. Again, the mustard seed, very tiny. But it will make a gigantic tree and the birds, I like the birds, are going to nest in its branches. Or like leaven, where you put it into flour and it turns into all this bread. This is going to expand our kingdom. It's going to make this large. I mean, this is going to be a kingdom. These few people that we've been reading about in the New Testament who believe in Jesus. I mean, we have several thousand people, right, that are following Jesus. Some of them are related to him are his apostles, are his disciples. He's gathering more and more people who are witnessing his ministry. This is going to be the kingdom that eats the Roman Empire and eventually is dominant even to this day in this world. This is going to be the leaven that spread out through all the flour. And again, the commentaries debate whether the birds represent a bad thing. I am going against not the bad thing. We like birds. And in not every case is a bird a bad thing. This just shows the sign of a healthy tree. While we talk about the narrow door, I think in the Matthew, we talked about the wide gate and the narrow gate. 
This is a similar passage, but this is about the door. It says he was teaching in villages on his journey towards Jerusalem. Again, our final entry to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, they said, are there going to be few people that are saved? Is this going to be a small number of people that are saved? And Jesus says that we should strive to go through the narrow door, that people will try to enter. It talks about like sort of in the Greek, it was sort of like a violent entry. People are trying to bang on the door. They're trying to rush in to get inside to kingdom of heaven. But when the master of the house, it says, has risen and shuts the door, people will be standing outside saying, let us in. And he's going to say, I don't know you. What do you mean you don't know us? We ate with you. We drank with you. Maybe there's even people in our time not eating and drinking with Jesus, but saying the right things, saying his name, wearing the right cross that you can see that they are Christians. And he says, you know what? I don't know where you came from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. And you'll be in the place of weeping and gnashing teeth. You're grinding your teeth. And when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you are out of it, people will come from the east, the west, the north, the south, who will be sitting in the kingdom of God with those people. And some of those who will be last will be first, and some who will be first will be last. Whew, tough sayings, right? But it means that not everyone who invokes the name of God goes to heaven. It's not enough to know, I guess, that Jesus is the Lord. Because even the demons know that Jesus is the Lord. These are people who are not denying Jesus that relationship, who are not rejecting the things that Jesus said. When I first became a Christian, this was going to be in my college years, was going through like a study of classes before I was being baptized. And someone came to me who had just become a Christian a few months earlier. And she said to me, she goes, you know, Jill, I know that maybe you want to become a Christian because of X, Y, and Z, but you, you don't have to. You don't have to become a Christian. You know, just do it if you think you want to do it. Now, the reason she was becoming a Christian, I'm not trying to call into question her Christianity, was because she was getting married, and I think she wanted a Christian wedding. I think there was some desire on the part of the family for her to be a Christian, but she was telling me I didn't have to become a Christian. I think if you believe in what the Bible says, you would never say that kind of thing to a person. Of course, everybody should believe in Jesus. Everyone should do that. But there are a lot of people that will put the name of Christian in their home over their heads, you know, that you say that is the case that someone's a Christian, but they really are doing it as a show. There's no relationship there. They're not interested in God. They're just trying to be part of a club. I guess is the way I want to say it. There's no desire. And some of the same people you saw with John the Baptist, where it says that they were resting on their laurels of being the children of Abraham. And John the Baptist was saying, you know what? I could take take rocks and make children of Abraham. Everyone sort of rests on something. I don't need God because of this. I don't need God because of that. I don't need to pursue any sort of relationship with God because I don't care. I don't want this. This is for show. This is for my wedding. This is so my family doesn't get mad. This is so whatever reason. And this discussion, I think, that we're having today about people falling away from the church, I have this feeling, and I I don't know because I wasn't around then, but a lot of people, maybe in like the 50s, felt pressure to appear to be Christian because it was sort of the going thing. And so people wanted to be a part of the group, wanted to be in the employees club. But the the place my dad grew up in, if you weren't a Christian in this one church, if you didn't belong to this one church body, you didn't get jobs. There was no prestige in town. You couldn't run for office. I mean, there was a lot of pressure that was outside of God to be a Christian. And I think now maybe we live in this place where people are just being more honest about it where if they don't want to have a relationship with God, they just walk away instead of fakely saying they're a Christian. And maybe we're just living in a more honest time about it, where people who don't want to have a relationship with God just walk away, and the people who do stay. And I guess that's when I think about these people knocking at the door. Some of those people are going to be like, Jesus, I went and became a Christian 
for the jewelry or for the wedding or for the family? Why am I outside this? Because they weren't becoming Christians. They were rejecting the gift God offered them and continuing to reject the gift that God offered them, but yet trying to pretend at that very last instance they weren't. Someone told me once in college that if he were about to die, he was going to just invoke every God he could think of at that very last minute, hoping that one of them would save him. That's not what God is looking for. And that's not how God works as this name invocation that you can say on your deathbed, hoping you'll get to one of the heavens. You know, that's, that's not it at all. What do you mean? This is where I think he's saying about it, that the narrow door is narrow because this is a way to God. This is how God wants us to come to him. Is he has given this offer to everybody, everybody, everybody on this entire planet. And this is the covenant, the deal, the agreement he is making with people. In our kind of culture, we just don't believe that there's a shut door. We believe that there's all the ways and we can get there through any way. There are many, many entrances, many, many doors, and we all come in through any way it is, that essentially all religions are the same, that it all gets to the same place. And what Jesus is saying is this is a narrow door, and God, the owner of the place, is going to say, I never knew you. You wanted to be apart from me in your life. You, it says you did evil. You were trying to live your life apart from me, and I'm going to give your wish to let you live apart from me. I mean, I think that's what it's saying. Someone asked the question about why God doesn't just let anyone in heaven, and it said because it would be kidnapping. You don't want to be where God is. You have no desire to be with God, and so now he is giving you the thing you always wanted. If he were to take you and put you into heaven against your will, that's kidnapping, right? That's you not getting what you wanted. You didn't want this, and now you are not getting it. When it's saying that people are going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west, this means that it's going to be everybody, Jews, Gentiles. It's going to be people from every place on earth coming to heaven, hanging out with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not necessarily the people who thought they were going there. They thought they were going to follow every rule. They thought they were going to walk some fine line. They thought that they could make a big show of things, and they're just not going to be in that position. Boy, I know, it sounds very tough indeed, because again, the gate is narrow. It's not wide. It's not every path. It is a narrow path. One that we're all invited to go into, but it's narrow because we don't want to go that path. We, as human beings, have decided not to go that path. Someone called the kingdom of God this at time when we're going to be hanging out with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God's banquet, that we are going to be in that final place, in that final banquet, which also means we get to eat in heaven too, right? That sounds exciting. And to eat with really intriguing people. I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. One of the commentaries said that, and this was the, uh, the Bach fellow who, said, who was writing that really good Luke commentary, that we learn a few things about heaven in this case, is that it's a place where we can rest, we can sit down, we're going to have company, and we're going to enjoy conversations and friendships with people in the Bible who died before us, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, will be a place from people from all over the world, and that it is a actual place. It's not just some sort of metaphysical spirit center. It's a real physical place. At that hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, uh, you better get out of here. You know, Herod wants to kill you, which is, of course, true. But then he says, you know, go tell that fox. He calls him a fox, which means wily. It means maybe dishonest. Essentially means someone who's slick or sly. I cast demons out. I cure people today, tomorrow, and I'm going to do it on the next time too. And he's going on his way. You're not going to kill me now. Prophets die in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place that kills the prophets. And I'm going to walk my way to Jerusalem. And on the way, I'm going to do it. I'm going to gather your children like hens. Then he laments about 
Jerusalem. He wanted to care for Jerusalem. He wanted Jerusalem to be this home of God, this place. When all these years, when it was first created by David, he said, quote, how often I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under his wings. And you weren't willing. You didn't want this. And behold, your house is forsaken. So again, that same idea that you're getting what you wanted. You wanted to be apart from me and you are apart from me. And it says that you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we know when we're going to hear that phrase, that's going to be when he enters and people put their palm leaves and their cloaks down on the ground. This is a forecasting of Palm Sunday. I like the idea of a hen gathering chicks under her wings. I am a bird watcher, as you might have guessed, and I love seeing when you get those little broods. Just today, I, I saw this group of nine little ducklings with a mallard duck, and someone flew into this pond that looked like it was sort of threatening towards the babies. And instantaneously, Dad Mallard flew in and guarded his babies, and the mother gathered up her young. It's such a visual image of how God wants to treat us. He wants us to be under his wing, cared for by him. And I just think that's such a great imagery to see, especially as a bird watcher. It's interesting that it's the Pharisees and some of the people that warned him about Herod. So you could tell that there were people that had this relationship with Jesus and not to have this thing that happened to John the Baptist happen to him. I think a good sign that these Pharisees are warning him. Like I said, there's, I, I see the sign of hope with them. But you know what he's saying? I'm going to Jerusalem. We're on our way. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to heal people and cast out demons. And I will get there. And yeah, we're going to have a showdown. We're going to talk for sure. Okay, that's not what Jesus said exactly. But you I get the idea. Yeah, this time is coming where you and I are going to talk. And I am heading my way literally to Jerusalem to this goal. And that ends chapter 13. Boy, there's a lot in these chapters. We see this in Luke really coming to a head and Jesus is on his mission. We know what he is planning to do. So my meditation for this week is going to be about this idea of the narrow door. We live in a world without narrow doors. We don't like narrow doors at all. I have my podcast, uh, Start With Small Steps, and I tell people to do things the way you do things. If you're someone who likes to write lists or like to do things this way or that way, do you. You do you, boo-boo. But that's when it comes to things that don't matter the soul. I believe in many different pathways to getting things done in life, to organizing and structuring your time. But when it comes to Jesus, this is the narrow door. There's this one path that is open to everybody. And when it says that we're cast out into the fires, into Hades. We are casting ourselves out. God is not casting us out. He is not wanting anyone to do this. But yet, somehow this door is narrow. And I think a lot of people just don't want to go through that door. My prayer is for all the people who are there thinking about the path to heaven and thinking about the big wide gate, the big wide door. Hope that they understand the narrow door. They understand how to seek and to ask and to knock at God's door and ask him to be let in. He wants all of us to come in. And what I'm going to share with other people is this concept of the narrow door. But the fact is that the invitation to come through the narrow door is for everybody. And people from the east, the north, the south, the west, they're all going to get a chance to go through that door. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe. And if you can leave a review for the podcast, I would appreciate it. The reviews help other people, help these services inform other people that this podcast exists. And if you wouldn't mind mentioning it to a friend, sharing it with another person. If you think you're getting value out of it, that'd be great too. Thank you very much.